here's the, the new book, 10 Instructions to Men of Desire. Um, and I'm going to show you just a little bit about how it's different from the old version you have. Um, this is a hardcover 6x9. And number one, it has an extensive introduction on the grade of the Elo Cohen and the development of that system. It has an overview of Pasquale's reintegration of beings and then about 30 new pages on the number system. So, um, and I'll, I'll skim over that in a moment as well. After that, there's about 40 pages explaining the universal table and new diagrams. And then we'll go into chapter one of the 10 instructions today. So just kind of skimming through this a little bit. Here's a, an extensive new introduction on the manuscript itself. Introduction on the development of the Yellow Cohen grades, as you see here, uh, with references from original manuscripts. And, and we show how various other orders set the systems up. And then we end with how we have our system set up. <clears throat> then there's a brief overview of Pasquale's reintegration of beings. Then there's an extensive uh, discussion on the Martinus number system. Uh, again, using original manuscripts as well as uh, a new summary of this, this number system. And then there's a new introduction to how to do theosophical addition, theosophical reduction, theosophical multiplication, and the powers of the number, which you'll see come up a lot in Sam Rattan's writings. Um, and this was something that I had to like really sit down and figure out again myself, because when you don't work with it, you kind of forget how it works. So hopefully this is a very clear uh, lesson so we can all make use of those things if we so wish to. <clears throat> then we have a collection of all the extant manuscript versions of the Universal Table from French libraries, EC manuscripts, Grenoble, Grenoble um, Amadou, Saint-Martin, et cetera, et cetera, and then a complete explanation of the Universal Table. We will have um, shortly a complete video on just this section in which I'll go through the entire Universal Table We'll record that and have that as a, uh, uh, an educational video on the universal table because it is as important as the tree of life is to Lorianic Kabbalah, this diagram is to Martinism and specifically the Elu Cohen. <clears throat> There's some extracts from the Metro Elu Cohen manuscript that relate to it. There's a new complete version of the table, which I can preview really quick here. We've got much more headings and imagery, um, much more labels, and we've corrected the table because most 20th century versions are wrong in multiple ways. So we've tried to correct that and make it more clear. Today we're going to use the basic version, and we'll use the more complex version when we get to those chapters. There's also new Ella Cohen correspondence tables from Robert Amadou. These come from his publication of Willermo's Lessons of Lyon, and these are translated to English. There's a brief comparison of the Tree of Life to the, to the um, Universal Table, and then a glossary. So those are some of the differences that are in the, uh, the introduction of the book. Now, the actual book itself, the version that you guys received in the Associate Handbook is just a giant, you know, it's 10 lessons, and there's no subheadings. It's not very well edited, and there's no explanations in it. Um, for example, right here, just on the first page, you can see there's five footnotes just explaining what is the text is about. Um, I think Tim Reader Wright mentioned that there are 84 footnotes in Chapter 1. Um, going back here, we can see there's a total of 246 footnotes. So the footnotes are there to really just help elucidate and explain the text and make some of its more um, abstract and occult meanings come to life for us, okay? And hopefully that is a lot of great benefit to y'all. Um, are we all on the same page with that so far? <clears throat> and again, just uh, mute your, unmute your microphone if you want to speak. Yeah, so I finally made it, uh, made it through the introduction and that was a challenge. Uh, you know, kind of new to all this. I read through it just to expose myself to it and then focused on a few areas. Um, but when I got into Chapter 1, uh, it really all kind of started coming together. Yeah, and that's pretty much the, the way to read 
any Kabbalistic text or Martinist text is you just have to kind of read it over once and just get the general lay of the land um, because you were learning a new language. Um, and as that document in the forum says to read Reintegration of Beings, it says read it once, then read it again and take notes. Or read it again and highlight it, then read it again and take notes. Look up those notes, come back, read it again. You know, it's just one of those things that takes multiple times to sink in. So with, with this talk, um, chapter one is the longest lesson. We could either try to just read through it, or we could just kind of skim through and talk about the concepts and maybe have a discussion. What do you all think about that? I'm up for whatever. Um, as I went through, if something really stood out, I kind of underlined it or made a note. But really, in Chapter 1, it, it seemed to sink in and kind of, like I said, it, it made the introduction really make sense. But a lot of other things, too, um, some stuff from, you know, the Blue Lodge and just things in general kind of started to click. Yeah, and hopefully these lessons will make, um, these lessons specifically are commentary upon Freemasons upon the three grades of uh, the, the first three grades of the Cohen, the Martinist cosmology in general, and just the system as a whole. So it should really help make a lot of things make sense. And then our next couple books combined with this will help prepare someone to really understand reintegration of beings so that we can actually get some true commentary going on that book. <clears throat> Any comments from anyone else? So, Are we going to go over the central axis of fire spirit? Uh, we'll go over that when it comes to that part in the chapters, but I don't think that's in this part right now. Um, okay. So chapter one, first lesson, is titled The Eternal and the Beginning. Um, this is essentially him talking about the fundamental principles of the order and uh, what they call the, the spiritual physics of the yellow cone. And it's all explaining that diagram you see on your left, the universal table. Um, which is the cosmology, the framework of the entire system. And San Martin says, the first principle of science we cultivate is desire. And he says that, you know, without this fundamental desire, there is no way that one can achieve wisdom. There's no way that no one can surmount all the, op all the obstacles before us, between us and wisdom. So, again, we're, we are men and women of desire. Um, and that, that principle, men of desire, that term, is not a purely Martinist term. It originally comes directly from Pascal's reintegration of beings, <clears throat> despite that some uh, modern orders don't really recognize that. So he talks about um, the necessity to cultivate the virtues and that we're going to start with humility, patience, and charity. Uh, humility so that we can be teachable, white belt mind, patience, with ourselves, patience with our students, patience with our initiators um, as we go through this process, and charity in the sense of true love for each other and love for our brothers and sisters. So it begins right away with the eternal emanates the first spirits, essentially in the beginning. And we'll read some sections of this, and please chime in if you have questions or comments. Uh, feel free to, if you're on the computer, you can see the footnotes, which are highly helpful. So from out of its divine, we're on page 130, if you have the book in front of you. From out of its divine immensity, being, necessarily existing only by itself, the eternal creator and guardian of all beings, emanated before time, free beings for its greatest glory. So that already is a monster of a sentence. He defines that there is the divine immensity, and that is the upper portion of this diagram on the left, the universal table, which is symbolized by a semicircle, showing that we can't even comprehend that circle. We can only just see the very bottom tip of it, very similar to the Kabbalistic conception of the world of absolute, or the conception of the Yud. You can only see the tip of the Yud. We don't even see the source of it. Um, now, right away, we should show that in that sentence, San Martin uses the word creator, and emanation. And this is part of the problem of Pasquale 
and San Martin is that they sometimes use the word creation and emanation haphazardly. Those two words mean completely different things. And we've tried to footnote and show when it means A or B. For example, um, creation mythos talks about God creating something out of nothing. So something is inherently separated from him. It is created, not, not emanated. Emanated means that it just flows out from deity, that it was not created, it is not separate, and it is an extension of itself or himself. Obviously, there's no gender here. It's just a convenient term. Pasquale's uh, cosmology is an emanationist theory, and through these lessons, you'll come to see when creation actually occurs, when physical matter occurs. In their system, uh, physical matter, earth, uh, manifestation is created and therefore is temporal and will eventually be dissolved, whereas emanation the spiritual immensity, divine immensity, the celestial immensity, the astral, the, those kinds of things, Bria, yet Zira, perhaps, those are emanated and are eternal because they are a part of the divine. Just like the ten spheres of the tree of life are said to be the body of God. So right away we need to be clear about those terms emanated and creation. Next, he gives us the next big key that we talk about a lot in the Cohen, which is he gave them a law, a precept, a commandment on which their emanation was based. And these are key terms. Law, precept, and commandment are as specific as wisdom, strength, and beauty, or as um, divine name, archangel, angel in the Golden Dawn. These are very specific terms that demonstrate spiritual principles, um, realities, aeons that the universe was based upon. And we'll come to see later on that the spirits the ten eight seven spirits correspond to the law, precept, and commandment. That the ten spirits are the law, the eight spirits are the precept, the seven spirits are the commandment. Like they are, they are an expression of that spiritual principle. <clears throat> uh, these spirits, these emanated spirits, were free, and they cannot be considered otherwise without destroying their distinct personality. So right away, Martinism postulates. Um, the law of free will, and that free will is absolute, it is um, unadulterated, and it could not be removed without creation being a sham, essentially. Emanation being a sham, reality. So, free will is of primary importance. Subheading five, we get to the prevarication of the first spirits. They began to prevaricate. And I, use, I specifically use the word prevaricate or prevarication in all of our texts, rather than saying transgression or breaking the law or sinning or any other term, because those terms are all incomplete and they conjure to our minds um, certain cultural and theological ideas which are not necessarily in place with what the word prevarication means. Um, this word, again, is a specific term in Martinism that we will be exploring through our lessons. So what was their prevarication? Without entering into the details, I would reply that the first crime was disobedience. Being, being free, they conceived in their complete and utter freedom a thought contrary to the law, the precept, and commandment of the eternal. So again, we're, he's introducing terms. Thought, will, and word are the primary um, components of our reality, of our personality, of our soul. Our thought, our will, and our word which again correspond to the 10, 8, 7, the superior, major, and inferior spirits, um, as well as the law, precept, and commandment. So these beings conceived of a thought that was contrary to the law. San Martin explains, imagine a sentinel who has been put on guard duty and who has been told to observe the various points of his duty. The sentry is free. He needs none to come and whisper to him to stay or not to stay. Of his own free will, he leaves his post and disobeys all aspects of his duty. He is caught and taken to task. This gives an idea of the transgression of the first spirits. Their sin was to have disobeyed the law, the precept and commandment they had been given from the time of their creation. Again, that word really should be emanation. And to have conceived a thought contrary to the eternal. So this image of a, of a sentinel 
will um, conjure a very specific image to some of you, depending on what grade you're at <clears throat> in the OMS. We all feel good about this. Any comments, questions? We've talked about desire, virtue, the first spirits, law, precept, commandment, prevarication. From then on, their communication with the eternal was broken, the, the prevaricating spirits. They separated themselves. God created space. So here's where creation occurs. He created a space and cast them into it. But whom did he make serve him to drive them from his divine court? He used spirits of the same nature, having been created or emanated at the same time they were, who also conceived their evil thought because they were tainted by it, but who made different use of their free will, remaining inviolably attached to the law, precept, and commandment of the eternal. So the problem isn't that there was a thought that was evil. The problem was that they acted upon that thought. They used their thought to generate a will which became an action. So not all the spirits fell. Some spirits heard the thought, and they made proper use of their free will. Therefore, those ones that made proper use remained attached to the law, precept, and commandment. Their fidelity um, allowed them to become vessels of the, of the Creator, vessels of God. And they, uh, they helped, they took the eternal side in this, this first war. There's a great line right here that Samaritan says, This is the war the scriptures speak of when they say that Michael and his angels fought against the demons and their angels, and that, victorious, Michael cast them out of the divine court into the space that had just been created. And if you are a member of other esoteric traditions, you might no notice the similarity of this to the quote, His limbs are still weary from the wars that were in heaven. And one thing we will see in our lessons is that the Martinus myth brings together the red thread from all over the secret esoteric tradition, albeit in a unique manner. So space became the container for the prevaricated spirits and the emancipation of the ternary spirits. Here we get into another specific term, emancipation. Emancipation could be likened to well, you know what? Let's go and look at our glossary. <laughs> there for a reason, right? Refers to the divine dispatching spirits to the circles, immensity, or aeons outside of his divine immensity or extended from his divine immensity. The emancipated spirits are sent out of the divine court with a particular order or mission. So if we look at the universal table, which is in the back of your book. It's on the dust jacket, which I'd recommend taking off to look at. I'd also recommend printing a 11 by 17 and tacking it on the wall when you're studying. Um, if we look at that, we have the divine immensity at the top. Then the very first sphere that connects the divine immensity and the super celestial, that first sphere with the golden sun, labeled 0 and 1 at the same time, 0, 1, 1 equals 10, is called the divine spirits of the superior ten. These are, this is the original, these are the, the superior spirits. Now, all existed within the divine immensity until because of the prevarication, the divinity created a space to exile the fallen spirits. That way they would not taint the rest of the spirits. They would not taint the immensity, the divinity. You can liken this to uh, tossing out the bad apple so that one you know, in the words of Guns N' Roses, so that uh, one bad apple spoiled a whole damn bunch. <laughs> so he emanated all the spirits existed in the divine immensity, the ten, the eight, the seven, and the three. <clears throat> when these prevaricated spirits were cast out into the void, the ternary spirits, the first ternary spirits, the, the spirits will change their numbers through the book, as you'll come to see. They, get, they basically get knocked down a level. Um, the first ternary spirits, the triplity, the, the number three spirits, were emanated to become um, the central fire axis spirits. So let's just continue from here. Number seven. Time, which is simply the succession or revolution of different bodies, did not yet exist. There was no subtle or base matter, only pure and simple spirits. 
good spirits in the divine court and evil spirits in space. And this isn't space as we know of, like Star Trek. This is just a void would be a better term, like tohu vabohu, perhaps, from Genesis. From then, God, in what he calls his thoughtful divine imagination, it's a, um, la pensée divine, uh, l'imagination pensée divine, or something like that. It's a complex term that is basically his divine thought, imagining within his own sphere, his own mind, conceived the creation of the universe in a visible, passive form to serve as a limit and barrier to the evil acts of the demons. Now the footnote down here says that Samartan uses the word creer, C-R-E-E-R. -E -E um, not crea because they're, well, crea, creer, which literally means creation. That is in clear distinction to the earlier word emana or emanation. So here we actually see the first act of creation proper. And in a sentence, he describes that creation was intended to be a limit, a barrier, a vessel, a ring past knot to contain the evil acts of the demons. You know, those first spirits now have become demonic. And in order to contain them, he emancipated, he sent out on a mission, the ternary spirits, from which became the central fire axis. And they came to close the circle of space wherein the perverse spirits were contained. And in his divine, thoughtful imagination, he conceived the creation of the principal body of the chief of the universe. That word chief could also be translated as head. Um, it basically means the main body of the head of the universe. It implies both the physical universe and a spirit, a personality, an entity that was equally divine and temporal, spiritual and passive, so it is part of above and below, in the form of the downward-pointing equilateral, well, equilateral triangle. He doesn't specify which direction yet. So to back that all up, there's the divine immensity. There's the prevarication. There's them wanting to be separate from the divine. There's them wanting to have a thought contrary to the divine. There's them wanting to be their own creator. Because of that, the void was created to protect the divine immensity. Just like in Lurianic Kabbalah, the concept of the fall or the banishing from the Garden of Eden, the flaming sword was put to, to protect the way to the Tree of Life. It was put there to protect the supernal triad from falling. And even if we go back, way back to Lurianic Kabbalah, and we just look at the, the, uh, the shattering of the vessels, the Shavira, when they reached Gabura. Um, the vessels shattered and fell, but the, the sword was placed after the supernals. So that the three, the triplicity, never fell into matter. It never fell into darkness. And that's why in all the Lurianic diagrams, you always see a three and a seven. The three represents the divine, unfallen. The seven represents the fallen creation, the Ruach, our personality in our world, symbolized by the seven planets. <clears throat> so, when we look at our universal table diagram, now we can see that the central axis of uncreated fire, or the, the central fire axis, that with all those spirits, those little faces cir circling us, that those little faces are the first ternary spirits. They are triple spirits in more ways than one. And they were set there as a limit to contain the fallen spirits. But also within that space, God emanated the chief of the universe. He emanated his equilateral triangle, which, as he says, is represented in our churches by four ineffable characters. And you can see that in your bottom of your diagram, the triangle that says yod heh vav -Hey, the tetragrammaton. This refers also to the four original properties and powers of the eternal. The thought, the mind, the will, the action, and being which are 10, 8, 7, and 4. Uh, which, as you get into your eloquent operations, reading this will make it make sense when you read those numbers in your operations. You're like, oh, this is that kind of a spirit I'm invoking. This is that kind of an action I'm doing. And it'll help to deepen your magical process so that you can actually start to discern what kind of passes you receive, discern what kind of spiritual actions you're doing. Um, we should also clarify that we are now talking about a passive creation, 
implying that divinity is purely active. There's nothing passive within it. It is active, it is uh, real, it is um, spiritual. Whereas now we have a passive material creation. You could call it the difference between absolute and asiya. Absolute being active and projective, asiya being passive and material, or heaven and earth. Now he goes on to talk about the threefold word of creation. God manifested his thought of creation to the spirits of the central fire axis through the same equilateral triangle, which was in the center of which, in the center of which he contained his threefold word of creation, as shown in the diagram. And he literally just gives a diagram with a triangle and a point. <laughs> he's like, as this triangle and a point shows. But he's, he's linking that to the universal table in which that point represents the yod heh vav As a question. Quick thought on the, quote, thought of transgression, heading number six. The implication is that it was the fidelity of the latter spirits that kept them from prevarication, rather than an act of discernment or discrimination on their part. So a seeming lack of action, seeing faithful in unity, versus action. I see what you're saying, yeah, um, fidelity. And feel free to mute, unmute your mic and, and chat. But I would say it's not that they didn't make an action, it's that they, they actually chose to remain, uh, well, not fidelity, <laughs> to remain uh, pure to it. Like he says right here, they made different use of their free will. So Martinism has this concept that any action has to first have a thought behind it, that is like the absolute principle, then a will behind it, we could call that perhaps a, a briatic con conception of it, and then an action, which we could say would be the yet zero aspect of it, which then manifests in a new state of being, which would be a sia. So there's your four worlds of any action occurring, any, anything being manifested. Difference with the spirits that remained faithful is that they received the same absolute influence, the same uh, evil thought, but they didn't let it continue to manifest. They curbed it at Bria. They curbed it at will. And because of that, their action remained loyal, and therefore their being remained loyal. Does that make sense? Uh, I so when I, I'm oh, sorry. Go for when it. I was reading it, uh, to me it kind of seemed like it was the choice, that everyone has free will and those thoughts are out there, but they those spirits specifically made the choice to act on it. Is that kind of in the ballpark? That's how I view it. Any other thoughts on that? Anyone? Isn't the pivot point the law, precept, and commandment? Yes, and the law, precept, commandment manifests through thought, word, will, and word. And you'll see that there, there's tables in your book that show that the law equals the ten, which equals the thought, which equals the father. The precept equals the eight, which equals the will, which equals the son, or the major spirits the law of precept. The commandment equals the seven, which equals the inferior spirits, which equals the action, which equals the Holy Spirit. Now there is an interplay between spirit and son that occurs. Seven and eight do some flipping back and forth sometimes, um, just as the statement that you'll become uh, the son of the Father through the Holy Spirit in traditional Christian esotericism. So uh, going back to the chapter we were talking about, um, I think that um, it was implied that as far as the spirits and some of them um, choosing evil and whatnot, separating, uh, I would say that's implied that you know, they're all angels. Uh, it's just that the separation of an angel into a demon is just based on how they, they choose to use a free will. Yeah. Um, also, I would say, yeah, thought equals actions. Um, 
And then separation. So duality is but, il is but an illusion. There is no two. This evil in this sense means separation. Uh, but it's also from separation the creation or form came to be. I think that's what I kind of got from that. There are some of the notes I wrote earlier. Exactly. You know, as Gandhi says, your, your beliefs become your thoughts, your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, your actions, um, I think he says, like, become your destiny or something like that. Um, everything has a chain of manifestation. Your, 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 your beliefs become your thoughts, your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, your actions become your habits, your habits become your values, your values become your destiny. And that's not entirely the same thing, but it's a similar concept. Um, to, to clarify the spirits of the central fire axis, um, they are, these are the plus three spirits, which are called inferior spirits at this point. And they become the spirits of the central fire axis, the ones containing the demons, containing matter. Well, containing, that matter's not even there yet. Containing the void. These spirits of the central fire axis are undifferentiated spirits of the three principal agents a sulfur, salt, and mercury. And these are what we will hear taught a lot later in the lessons as the three spiritual principles or three spiritist essences. They are the alchemical principles, but they're used in a much different way than we've probably ever seen them used. This is not the same way the Golden Dawn uses alchemical principles. This is not the same way the Splendor Solace does or most labor laboratory alchemical texts. Um, they're used in a very unique way. So at first, at this point in at this point in time, which time doesn't exist yet, you know, this is all before the beginning. Those three principles, salt, sulfur, and mercury, are undifferentiated. They're united in the the trend, the trinity, the plus three inferior spirits. As time develops, they will crystallize into separate spirits which will be the sulfur spirits, which are specifically the fire spirits, then the aquatic spirits of salt, then the terrestrial spirits of mercury. And that might be confusing to some people who think of mercury as watery and salt as material, but they actually do something different, which we'll explain later in future lessons. So Tim says he was confused that the ternary spirits redeeming the fallen spirits, also being the inferior spirits. So at this point, the ternary spirits are not redeeming anything. They're just containing. They're, they're just setting a barrier, a ring past knot. And that's why you'll see in one of your, in the master table diagram in the book, which is a new diagram that no one's ever made before, at the top we have the ancient spirits, 10, 8, 7, 3. Okay. Um, at this point, the superior spirits are 10. The major spirits are both 8 and 7. And then the inferior spirits are called 3. They're ternary. They're, inf they're called an inferior spirit. After the, all of this happens, once matter gets created, um, the universe will shift to a 10, 7, 3, 4 model, as well as a 10, 8, 7, 4 model. And I know that sounds highly confusing, but just roll with me, and the lessons will explain it further, okay? Um, let's get back on track. So the three spiritual essences within the spirits of the central fire axis. Like we just said, they, um, they are the three alchemical principles emanated. They are carriers of the ineffable word, yod They possess the primitive alchemical essences, from which they would eventually make the true physical matter of the universe. So those pr spirits, these central fire axis spirits, are the ones that actually create matter. God doesn't create matter. His spirits create matter. Um, these spirits possess both a triple nature, a, a three nature, by their um, containing salt, sulfur, mercury. They also have a four nature, a quaternary nature, by containing the word of the eternal yod So, Samaritan says, one may ask, what is this word? I would say that the word contained the plan, the execution, and the workings of the universe. 
in the beginning was the Word, and the Word is with God, and the Word was God. The same was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and this life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, but that darkness comprehendeth it not. So everything came forth from the Word. Um, and this is one of the most profound teachings of Martinism, of Christian esotericism in general, is this conception of the Word. And for all you Masons out there, that is why finding the Word is of such importance in that tradition, and it becomes of even more importance in the Kohen. Um, I would say that, so from here he's talking about the essential fire acts, but spirits contain the universe, contain the void, and they begin to execute their, their uh, mission by bringing forth from themselves these essences. These three essences, salt, sulfur, mercury, were essentially matter in their neutral state, matter that had not been activated yet, had not been vivified. Um, There's a footnote. Well, let's get to the next section. Thus, according to the language of the scriptures, they were without form or in their neutral state and void. They were passive. Passive life could not enter into forms. They were not yet made. And this links to Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. So that's basically where we're at. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. At this point, the Spirit of God has not yet, quote, moved upon the face of the waters, which all of this is, of course, allegorical. It is symbolical. Um, these are ways that we try to express very abstract principles. And at this point, we're just intellectually studying this. Through your meditations, it will yield more fruit. Through your rituals, they will come to life. And the goal is that each of these things, just like we say in the Associate Handbook, the myth is useless unless it actually speaks something to you that you can relate to, unless it expresses something that makes sense to your reality, your actual worldview, your experience. And there should come a point in time where you literally experience the word moving upon the face of the waters. You should see this in your mind's eye. You should feel it. You should experience it. And those are all steps towards gnosis. So that's kind of a, uh, a full thought right there. Any, any questions before we get into numbers or comments? Okay, so next he goes into numbers. Numbers as being the science of emanation. So this is his form of numerology or gematria or the term we prefer to use is arithmosophy because that's what Pasquale used. It literally means the love of numbers, or the, the, the wisdom of numbers, right? Arithmosophy. Um, so he acknowledges that just, you know, numbers have always been important. And here he throws in a new term. Without numbers, you can have no knowledge of divine spiritual part or the general universal terrestrial part. And that is a mouth load of a, scent of a term. General universal terrestrial part. Or the French term is uh, partie universelle générale terrestre. Um, <laughs> you'll also see the general, general universal terrestrial part, specific terrestrial part. You're going to see divine spiritual, um, all these other terms. Essentially, the universal terrestrial is Earth. It is our solar system. It is matter in general. It is universal matter, the, matter, the macrocosm. Whenever you see... Um, uh, specific terrestrial, that is literally referring to the body of man or woman, man or woman, the, the body of Adam Kadmon, um, which we should understand as Kadmon, which then becomes us, right? Whenever you see divine spiritual, we're essentially talking about God or the eternal, the divine immensity, that which is um, transcendent, Okay. So we have got the, the specific, which is our body, the universal, which is um, earth and matter, and then we have the divine, which is the transcendent. And we can easily see these as the four worlds of the Kabbalah, 
which there's a section on that around page 120, I think. <clears throat> so he just says, you know, numbers are important for all the reasons that Pythagoras said, for all the reasons that Kabbalah says, and I think we can kind of um, skim over that. You know, numbers are considered to be eternal. They're considered to be solid, definite sciences. And through numbers, we can understand all things. Numbers are used as a proof of all things as well. Um, so I highly encourage that you study this section and then really go back and read the, um, the 30 pages that we put together on numbers and tack those things up on the wall and start to memorize it, start to understand what one represents, what two represents, what three represents. That way, at a glance, when he says, these are number two spirits, you're like, oh, well, these are demonic, evil spirits of separation. Or that this is a number five operation. You're like, oh, this is an operation of uh, the demons again. Or this is a eight operation. You're like, oh, this is an operation of Christ in his ability to manifest the word before, above, and below. Four plus four equals eight. Things like that are where we want to get your, your knowledge of numbers to. He then goes on to say that the number defines the spirit. So when we say a 10 spirit, that number 10 defines what they are. And everything you know of 10 is what that spirit is, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> the numbers are the first spirits. The number of God is one, the unity of divinity. The first spirits came forth as 10, 8, 7, and 4. Okay? Um, you're going to see a lot of contradictions in these depending on which text you're reading and what era of the Cohen they're reading it from, as well as what era of the mythology they're reading from. Um, you have to discern, are we talking about before creation? Are we talking about the divine immensity? Are we talking about now as fallen beings trying to reclaim our robe of glory? Uh, their number before the prevarication was higher than those we usually give to the cherubim, the seraphim, the archangels, and angels, who had not yet come into being. So here they're saying that these spirits, these original spirits, 10, 8, 7, 4, superior, major, inferior, and minor, that these spirits um, are of a more transcendent and primordial nature than our typical spiritual, angelic, and demonic hierarchies that we see in most magical grimoires and the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. They should not be confused with that yet because they are the principles we could say, in the aim so or. You know, the divine immensity is the aim so for. Um, so it is above the archangels, which don't actually manifest until Bria in Gloriana Kabbalah. <clears throat> the origin of evil. I'll stop a moment to consider the state of the universe of the spirits before their prevarication. Uh, maybe this is a, a point to stop. I'm going to have to cut, or cut it now because I have to check out of my hotel. Um, going line by line like this is time-consuming, but I think it's, you know, you all tell me. We can chat about this in the group me and tell me if this was beneficial or not or if you prefer to just have more of a roundtable overview discussion. Um, I am down for either. Um, again, this is the longest chapter as well. And it's one of the most thick because we're talking about basic principles. As we go through, we should be able to kind of skim over things easier. A um, couple minutes. Do you guys have any questions real quick before we log off? Uh, 